Hi, Michaela. Hello, Steve. So today I'm going to be asking you questions that listeners and viewers have sent in on the subject of grief. So perhaps you could say a little bit about why it is we are addressing the subject of grief today. Hmm. Well, I think for us personally, um, a lot of our students recently have had to deal with loss and grief. And so we've gotten a whole bunch of questions from people who've lost their fathers, relatives, babies, um, you know, possessions, things uh, within COVID that were um, very much a loss and grief situation. So um, I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about some of the questions people had and then maybe also just some general strategies around uh, being with grief and working through grief um, as a means of also staying connected with one's own body, um, with one's own process, and then, of course, within the relationship with the people remaining, you know, who might also be grieving or who might not know how to actually be with grief or handle grief. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get straight to it. First question here, do you have any tips or practice recommendations on how to work with unresolved stuff when someone passes away? I was lucky in that I had time to work through a lot of my stuff before my dad passed away. But when I look back, there are moments when I wish I was kinder to him. I wasn't mean, but I wish I was more compassionate and loving mm. rather than frustrated. Mm. Well, I think to open this up a bit, um, there's you know a variety of circumstances where people are not even speaking with, let's say, their fathers or their relatives. Uh, they've been estranged or um, the death happened very quickly and there was no way of knowing. And then there's uh, better versions where there was actually some time to connect and be with somebody. But um, whatever the situation is, when there's unresolved things because people haven't spoken in years or it felt like there wasn't enough done, one of the ways that that can be worked with, which also really supports grief. So even if everything was being said, it's sometimes useful to write a letter or to create a kind of a document um, or even a voice recording, if that's easier for people to do, where everything gets spoken and everything gets said, both the good uh, and the bad and <laughs> the ugly at times in the sense that um, it, it allows for grief to kind of have an, a, a way to pour out and make sense without that person actually being involved, which is also a good thing because sometimes the things we have to say so that we can grieve fully are not very nice. And sometimes it would be something like, well, I wish I would have been more compassionate. I wish I would have appreciated you more. And so in, in writing this and in writing this as fully as possible, you can then later use that material and that letter uh, in some kind of a ritual where either um, that person, whoever that person is, right, um, reads it aloud to a photo of whoever has passed or reads it aloud and then burns it or offers it in some way that kind of creates an ending ritual. And sometimes what happens when people do these letters, because you can also do these letters, by the way, in a breakup, uh, the person doesn't necessarily have to die for something like that to happen. Um, often when that happens, the first iterations are quite full on. And uh, then as time passes and people go through the iterations, more of the generosity and more of the compassion can also be expressed. And I think that's a very good way to go. Well, perhaps as a follow up, what would you say to somebody who's, who expresses as this um, as this questioner seems to be hinting at anyway, guilt um, about well, yeah guilt about how one conducted oneself with the deceased? Is there something specific? I mean, you know, it's hard to say if there's something specific in general. I think. And this is why grief also plays into how we conduct all our relationships, you know, long before death. I think uh, in general, um, there's always the question, have we said it all? Have we praised enough? Have we been generous in our 
attention? Have we been compassionate? Have we been understanding? And uh, we're human, and so I don't think there's a single person who, when they look back at relationships, doesn't go, I could have been a bit more generous, I could have been a little bit more um, outspoken or, or, you know, showy in my love or, or even more direct or even set a boundary. It doesn't matter. It can bo both, you know, into the negative or the positive aspect. So I think in general, the, the, the good idea is always to assume that people aren't around forever and to give them as much of our love and compassion and praise as we can. Um, as a means of making sure that if something should happen, uh, you feel somewhat fully given. All right, so the next question here. I can't help but reflect on all the ways I'm like my dad. Some feel positive and some negative. I'm also noticing the beliefs I've taken on from him. Some beliefs serve me and some don't. Do you have any thoughts on how to work through and reconcile this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, just in the question, of course, there's a certain kind of um, self-reflection and understanding that's not always uh, easy to come by in the sense that we're not always that clear on what's the good and what's the not so good in what we received from our family of origin. And doing a bit of work around family of origin, as this questioner clearly has done, is very useful because... Um, <laughs> There's there's the things we've picked up that we just take on without knowing we've picked it up. And then there's the things we've purposely negated or, you know, didn't want from our parents, but that have somewhat crept in. So in the examination of what we were given by our parents, it's really useful to uh, spend a bit of time on um, what are we rejecting, what are we embracing, what's working for us, what isn't working for us. And often that's best done with a therapist, of course, who knows how to ask the right kind of questions. And particularly family of origin work can be very easily done with a, uh, with a you know, counselor. And there's, of course, also family constellations and all of those kind of things that can be done. If somebody doesn't want to do, uh, work with a counselor, then the way to go at that is uh, once again in, um, you know, being as detailed as possible with the questions, right? What are the assumptions that I've taken on unconsciously that I reject? What are the assumptions of unconsciously that I've taken on but that are okay? What are things um, that I don't want to carry forward into my relationship, into my relationship with my children? You know, things of that nature and really, really detail it and look at it um, with a fine tooth comb, so to speak, to see what uh, can be unearthed and what can be worked with. Yeah, that's very interesting. And that process of reconciling with one's uh, parental lines, I suppose, um, we've, we've designed workshops around that specifically. Maybe you could say something a little bit about those workshops. In fact, uh, depending on when you're watching this, one of them is coming up in Omega, the Omega Institute in, in New York, upstate New York. Um, what, could you say something about those those workshops around this issue that we've designed? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole uh, series of workshops we've created where we look at um, imprints, right? But there's one specific that we sometimes call lineage and liberation, some of which is what goes into the Omega workshop as well, where we look at the imprints from our father's and mother's side and the lineages that carry forth information. And then we work with it in the body, both uh, in uh, exploring releasing but also forgiving right and i think that's a very very important um, aspect of uh, engaging with one's you know imprints i mean you know obviously everybody nowadays looks as attachment at attachment but i think attachment is not nearly as important as uh, the information that's given forth through the imprints of our parents and our paternal and maternal imprints and, and lineage lines. There's questions in lineage and liberation that are specifically about this. What are the beliefs? What have we inherited? How, and this is also very important, which this questioner is not 
saying, but it's a big deal, is how our parents were in relationship, of course, influences how we are in relationship or how we don't want to be in relationship. And we pick up a lot of that in um, in the early years, and then that really influences the partners we pick and how we behave with those partners. So it's, it's an important aspect. And to involve the body in both the excavation and the integration of those aspects yeah. uh, is quite key. Yeah. Uh, and we, that's, that's a big focus in the workshop. Okay, great. Well, um, Omega, <laughs> September 2022. Um, next question about brain fog. I'm finding it really hard to focus and do simple tasks. It's been five weeks since he passed away. It's this person's father. I know it doesn't sound long, but it feels really long. Time feels very distorted, and my brain can't seem to focus, and I don't feel creative at all. Any thoughts on how to deal with brain fog? Well, within the context of grief, right, we, we now know, and this is kind of an important thing, because for many, many years, um, grieving was seen through one lens, and that's the model of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was a pioneer in the realm of grieving. And she had these stages of grief, and that's still the gold standard. But of course, um, now we know, uh, just from you know research in this well, other lenses into grief, that grief is very much nonlinear, and that these stages don't happen uh, you know, orderly one after the other, and they also come and go, and there's other aspects like shame or blame or, you know, things of that n nature as well. So the kind of nonlinear um, unraveling of grief is something that requires a lot of energy. And um, I think one of the things I want to say about that in the context of the brain fog and feeling fuzzy and not being motivated and not being um, in any way creative is that grief can't be rushed. And that kind of energy that grief takes is uh, important to take because if you're not actually grieving when it happens, you're going to have to deal with it for way, way, way longer in the aftermath. So. Uh, if at all possible, it's really important to kind of dive into the grief and kind of, you know, kind of hit it as fully as you can with crying and the gnashing of the teeth and the wailing that, you know, people don't want to do uh, because they feel like, you know, they'll never recover from it. But actually, the way in is the way through when it comes to that kind of grief. When you're trying to hold the grief at bay, you need an enormous amount of energy to do that. And that energy um, zaps you off creative energy, it zaps you off um, motivation often makes people very tired, very depressed, unable to function properly. And that's partly the grief, the missing, the, you know, all of that, but it's partly the holding back that kind of somewhat in the beginning explosive upwelling of, of energy. And a lot of people just talked with somebody a few days ago about this. A lot of people find that the other side of that object grief is actually a kind of an ecstatic feeling where when you can't hold on, you know, and hold it down that grief and you actually let yourself into that, there's a huge opening in it, which is not always apparent. And it's certainly um, very unpleasant because it comes with abject pain, but there is a different side to it where that energy flows all the way through and flows very strongly and therefore can be dealt with in the body particularly a bit uh, more, um, let's say, economically and eventually the brain fog will lift and eventually that heavy feeling will lift because not so much energy is bound up in keeping it together, so to speak. You know, you, you talk a lot about the body and embodiment and recruiting the body in these sorts of uh, processes. Um, what advice do you have to involve the body um, in the grieving process, both close to the death and in the, the weeks and months that follow? Mm. Well, one of the things about working with the body is that the body, of course, is the part 
um, of us where these things either get stuck or get worked through. And um, it's not just the mind, it's not just the heart, but it's also the body. And often in moments of intense grief, as it is in moments of intense shock or anger or things like that, our body starts um, to create coping patterns and coping reactions that often come with a closure, with a tension, with a contraction. And then over time, that tension, contraction, closure becomes a pattern and that pattern sticks with us long after the initial grief has passed, which once again brings us back to how we hold things together, how we hold you know, the, the emotions down or a certain kind of a shock that pulls us up and out of our body so that we don't have to feel as much. And so the bodily patterns of grief and other traumas um, are where things will get stored for the long run, so to speak. And of course, often uh, where we contract and where we close down and where we clench is where we have had previous injuries, either emotional or physical or, you know, both. So when we keep the body moving, like in things like nonlinear movement, which is something that we teach, um, but also uh, moving as in um, actually going for walks, laying on the ground, having as appropriate, uh, you know, have other people hug you and hold you and, and um, be with you, then the opening of the body and the letting the body actually process the emotions allows for uh, there to be kind of more long-term positive effects and stuff doesn't get stuck so much. And so in nonlinear, for instance, we have a specific modality that is release. And in that modality, you essentially allow, the bo allow yourself to feel where there's closures, where there's tension, where something is clenched, where something is held down and just move with that so things can wash out. It's also important to say, I think, that the body has a natural ability to release those things because um, the way the nervous system is created is so that this stuff washes out and we can move on. So the same way uh, an accident or falling off something or somebody hitting you with the car um, produces something in the body that can be released. There's the shaking and the little bit of weepiness and, you know, the nausea and all of that. If you actually allow that to happen, the body can recover much quicker. But often, of course, in grief, there's so much to do. You know, you have to keep it together. There's relatives, there's other, you know, there's funeral arrangements to be made. You don't want to cry in front of the doctors or the nurses or your children or stuff. So it all gets clenched in. So the involvement of the body and the, the getting it out of the body is really, really important in the long run. Our next question here is about loss, but not loss of a person. Uh, of course, our last episode, we did a books episode and we were talking about the books you've been reading and uh, your love of books in general. And uh, this question addresses that. We'll be so curious how the loss of your books affected you. Uh, the loss here of your books in the Thomas Fire, um, 2017, in which your house burned down through your belongings and uh, animals. You lost also many animals in that fire, etc. So that's what this is referring to. Uh, did you repurchase your favourites? Did it make more room for something else? Maybe you'll write a whole book on what you lost and gained from that experience. This is a question here on Instagram. Mm. That's a big question. And of course, there's a little bit of backstory there, as you mentioned, and many people, of course, know that. Uh, the house burned down. I lost my beloved dogs and some many other animals, actually. And um, I also lost my library. And... Um, you know, there's different layers of grief with different things. You lose everything that you've amassed over uh, the years in the sense of memories and keepsakes and heirlooms. And that's one layer of grief, of course. And that's an interesting layer of grief because a lot of people um, are somewhat casual with that because they think it's just stuff, right? It's a uh, I, I heard many times, oh, it's just belongings. You can't be attached to things. And um, so within that, of course, there, there lies a whole other thing when people kind of um, somewhat uh, diminish your grief 
which is also what I wanted to say about the other questions, right? That, of course, when it comes to loss, and particularly when it comes to death, um, there's a lot of um, projection on the, you know, on the side of the people who witness it. Uh, we had somebody else lose their father recently, um, and there was uh, conversations about, um, you know, the, the the father wanting to end the suffering before the suffering ended him. And, uh, you know, there was a whole conversation about how uh, people couldn't deal with that, right? Couldn't deal with um, that kind of loss. And often people don't know how to deal with suicide or deal with really abject suffering. And so in any kind of loss and grief situation, there's always the projection of other people and how they deal with death on their end. And that's an added um, complication when we look at grief and loss and death, because often the people who lose something, um, in addition, have to deal with having to comfort other people or having to deal with their projections, either by kind of whitewashing and bypassing the grief to immediately go to the spiritual lesson, right? Or the learning or the, oh, it's all for the best. Uh, you'll see there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Or whatever people say, he's no longer suffering. And, you know, all of that stuff, which is kind of a jump that negates the necessary process of the wailing and crying and grieving and being angry and being sad and, um, you know, shame and blame and all of those kind of things. And so when it comes to belongings versus beings, animals and humans alike, often people make an even faster jump uh, in that bypass because, um, you know, it's so uncomfortable to feel for a lot of people what it would be like to lose absolutely everything. And they immediately go to, oh, this must be great. Now you start from scratch. Or, oh, now somebody said to me three or four days after the fire, oh, great, now you know what non-attachment feels like. It's a bit early. Right? <laughs> and so um, when it comes to things like having lost my books or having lost the house, um, you know, very little sympathy was had, so to speak, by other people. Um, because it's a difficult thing to deal with and it falls into the realm of belongings and you know materialism and stuff like that. But things have a very specific purpose, not only in our you know material realm, but uh, for me personally, and I've, I've heard this from other people, the items were connected to experiences, they were connected to memories, they were connected to people. And so when you lose the item, you lose that portal into that memory um, and the portal into that connection. I mean, I've talked about this before. I had this box of my grandmother's and it was so dear to me because it sat on my nightstand and my whole family history was woven into that box. And every time I looked at that, my grandmother and her brothers who were artists and all of that loaded up and it was this really positive kind of lineage connection. And when that box was gone, all of that disappeared. And, and so um, when uh, this particular person's asking about how the loss of the books affected me, it's kind of there's a whole library of my um, my growth and, and my exploration that's gone. Right? Because a lot of these books I've had since I was 14, 15, 16, they were given to me by a, a kind of a, a godfather slash uncle. We weren't that closely related, but um, and they had been in his possession. He was his, uh, close to 90 when he died, so they'd been in his possession for a long time. And, and all of those books I knew and I had read and I knew about, but I didn't know their titles. I couldn't remember their titles, right? And I couldn't get them anymore. And so there's a whole realm that's lost um, and memories around that from university and from, you know, people having given me books and the time in my life where I received a whole bunch of books uh, in a very funny way that you know, know about as well. All of that was just wiped out. And with that, there was kind of a clean slate, but there's also this feeling of kind of a, it's almost like a memory loss, 
you know, that that came with the books being gone. And so when she's asking, did you repurchase your favorites? No, I didn't. A few things, but not much because I didn't remember. And only over time now, you know, I remember some of these books and I look them back up and sometimes I get them, but often they're no longer available. And there's one particular book that been trying to remember the title and I can't and I don't know the author and it was probably my most favorite book and I've googled and googled and googled and haven't found it and it is bugging me so much <laughs> but maybe you, you can know. describe it maybe a, a listener will recognize it it's a it's a fiction it's a, it's a fiction I thought it was called the man but it wasn't it's the story of this woman who uh, lives in New England with her grandmother and um discovers Willem Reich and the Oregon box and all kinds of things. And then she goes to the Bay Area and becomes a chef um, and starts her career in an egg restaurant. Um, so it's this very specific book that talks about her engagement into life and men and, uh, you know, her first love and her and the men she ends up with. And, and it's very multi-layered and very beautiful. And there's the story of her and her brother and how they lost her parents in a car crash so it's gone it, I don't know where to find it I don't know the name if anybody knows this book please let me know <laughs> of course one's home is not simply a collection of possessions it's also a sort of psychological uh, entity yeah one's home yeah yeah and I, I think to me, and I think there's, you know, people constantly losing their homes in some in some way, either through divorce, bankruptcy, a flood, a fire, you know, or, or other ways. Uh, to me personally, home really is what stabilizes me. And I have huge, um, uh, I don't know what to say about it. I, I'm a homebody and home is super important to me. And it's the grounding force and it's the, you know, the kind of safe place to which to always return um, that that's very sacred and very uh, important and so not having home and having lost uh, even you know there was nowhere to sleep I mean there was nothing there was just dust was quite uh, full on now of course you've got a you've rebuilt and you've created a new home uh, from scratch from the ashes you know what advice do you have for people who find themselves having to rebuild um, a life, a home, you know, losing an intimate partner or a loved one or a family member? It does require one to reorganize or restructure one's life. You have to rebuild in some yeah. certain way. There's a hole. There's something missing. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for people in that sort of a situation to rebuild? Well, you know, I think it's a bit different for each person based on their where they are in, in their life and in the phase of life. But in general, and this brings us back to what we were talking about to begin with, with loss and death, I think that um, you have to see the loss of a relationship and the loss of a loved one or a house or an animal, um, you know, or a career as a death. And you have to give it that kind of value where you fully allow yourself to grieve and where you acknowledge that, that that loss is substantial. And regardless of what other people say and how other people go, it's for the best or, oh, he was an idiot or... Which may be uh, true. <laughs> which may be true. You have to give it the value that it um, deserves in your own mind, body and heart, which is one of abject grief and loss death dead or alive right because um and i said this after the fire and i'm definitely saying this again talking about books again right i read this beautiful book from martin prechtel uh, that's all about grief and praise and he is very strong on that um the grief for someone or something is uh, a sign of how much you loved and is a sign of um, how much that person and that situation meant to you and so grieving fully is honoring fully and is loving fully and I think that's an important piece even if it's a bad relationship or you know 
a house or or an animal, which is exactly as deep a grief as a human, if not more sometimes, because there's not none of the, you know, the stuff attached to it that sometimes is in a parental relationship, for instance. So giving it um, the the value and the space and the time to properly grieve and also to properly praise allows us to at least uh, make the space for the next thing to arise and for the ashes, you know, to to be the fertile ground out of which the next thing can actually grow. And of course, the other thing is when we talk about grief, right, There, there's a certain kind of a um, tough situation that while we want things to stop so we can process life of course moves on and I remember when James died my previous teaching partner um, I just wanted things to stop for a moment right I just wanted a moment where you know the, everything stopped there's this beautiful poem you, I don't know if you know that poem I think it's W.H. Auden where it's like stop the clocks right it's that feeling you want you want to just have a moment but life is just this river that flows regardless if the person's in it or not and that was uh, quite shocking to notice how life just moved on even though I needed that moment and within that of course is the is the kind of um, you know advice of seeing how you can carve out some time to stop uh, and at the same time, often we have to just move on. The funeral needs to happen or you have to move out. Or in my case, I had to get water for the animals who survived. There was no uh, electricity or running water. So to kind of, you know, transport buckets and, you know, all of and get feed. And, and so I had to function even though I didn't want to function. So that taking some time to not function within having to function, I think is super, super important to rebuild. And then on the other end, um, it's very useful to know that, um, you know, rebuilding will happen. Uh, reconciliation of the circumstance will happen and getting as much help as possible in that context. Well, perhaps then my last question what advice do you have for those who are supporting people who are grieving? You've talked about bypass and uh, projection, and there is an unfortunate habit of people pe of people uh, attempting to make things all right, uh, responding to the grieving person out of their own personal discomfort at seeing the grief occurring, um, rather than an attempt to support the grief. Yeah. I think sometimes people also are at a loss to know what to do. It's unskillful response is not only coming from their projection or discomfort. You know, they, they, they want to calm the person down so that they yes. don't feel uncomfortable. It's sometimes that, but also I think sometimes people just don't know what to do. I mean, what to do. Yeah. Uh, so what advice do you have for people who want to support somebody who's grieving but perhaps aren't sure how? Yeah. I think that's a, you know, in, in general, even uh, in somebody going towards the grief, meaning uh, when you're dealing with somebody who is dying, for instance, right, it's very, very hard to know what to do. I remember when my closest friend as a, as a young girl, I, I had a very close friend who um, died when she was 19, when she was 18, I was 19, and she was dying of a very aggressive cancer, and I had zero skills, right, and um, I would go there and the thing that you do when you see somebody is you go, hey, how are you doing, right? How is it going today? And of course, you know, that wasn't an appropriate question because it was clear it wasn't going well and it wasn't going anywhere. So I stopped going to see her back then because I didn't know how to deal with it. And, um, you know, not till later to, did I actually learn that... Um, it's okay to actually not know and it's okay to go to somebody and say, I don't know how I can help you or support you. Um, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What's most useful, right? And very often people will be able to articulate, even the ones who are dying, right? Or, or 
in the aftermath of grief, they can go, look, I really just need a bit of space or, you know, why don't you just be with me and let's not talk about it or uh, I need a shoulder to cry on. Um, you know, those you can always ask, how can I help you? How can I support you? What can I do for you? But also, and this is, of course, known in uh, any intact community, right? One of the things that you can do to support somebody in grief is to support them with the things that they won't have time for, which is why in any community, right, the way typically it's done is you make sure that people have food, um, that you, people have sustenance uh, and, and, you know, the support that they need so that they can deal with whatever they need to deal with. That's kind of one of the oldest ways of supporting somebody in loss is to feed them, uh, even if they don't want to be fed because they don't want to eat, right? But to keep their energy up, to um, create a safe space, to make sure that they rest, um, to help them in the ways that you know gives them joy. And the most important thing is to not uh, have them have to spend energy on you. So the worst you can do is make a scene and wail, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and make that person have to comfort you instead of you comforting them, which happens a lot, believe me. And I've seen a few choice uh, versions of that in, in various moments. Um, so that's super important is that you keep your own process away from the person who's lost, let's say, a husband or a baby, right? I mean, and by all means, don't give those spiritual tropes. She's with God now, or uh, there's a better place. They're no longer suffering. All of that might be true, but that's not where that person is. The person's in pain and sad and grieving, and you just want to be there and say, I can't even imagine what it's like, but I'm here. Um, you know, I love you. I'm here to support you. Whatever you can say that's within that context of relationship without bypassing or making it about you. Oh, very interesting indeed. Thank you. Um, is there anything left to say uh, that comes to your mind before we close this podcast? Well, I mean, this is not, you know, exactly the topic that most people want to engage with in the sense that we would rather not want to feel what it's like to really lose someone or something. But it happens and it happens all the time. And there's a certain kind of a, um, you know, life affirming aspect to turning towards death and turning towards grief as part of the, the whole cycle and the knowing that when you love very fully, you will also lose very fully. And that's not necessarily um, a pleasant thought, but it's unavoidable, but it's also the sign of big love and big relationship and uh, and deep belonging to a house or an animal or a person. And so I think it's that turning towards the entirety of the situation that makes it a bit more workable. Let's put it this way. Well, thank you very much, Michaela. Thanks, Steve.